day two of the CLIS online conference. And welcome back to all of you who were with us yesterday and to you who just tuned in. Uh, from the studio here in the Faroe Islands, we will guide you through the presentations and invite you to contribute with your questions and comments as well. Nearly 700 people have registered for the CLIS online conference, so we are a part of a record-breaking event here. Thank you for making this happen. My name is Erna Lava Olsen. I'm a researcher at Fiske Alling. I have a master's degree in meteorology and oceanography from the University of Bergen in Norway. And I have specialized in physical oceanography. Uh, my main interest is um, the oceanography of the Faroe East Fjords. And in the studio here with me today is Eilif Gord. Thank you. Yeah, I am Eilif Gord. I am director of the Faroe Marine Research Institute locally named Helstowan. I graduated in biology, master degree in, uh, at the University in, in Ottensee, Denmark, and I got my Dr. Philos degree at the University in Tromsø, Norway. I have specialized in uh, biological oceanography and plankton ecology. Now, before we start today's topic, which is the environmental impact and societal responsibility, we want to highlight a couple of details. First, during the conference, most present presentations are pre-recorded, while some are streamed online. Regardless, you will all have the opportunity to contribute with uh, input yourselves. While the, uh, the presentations are ongoing, you will find that you have have a, uh, and and uh, you may find uh, that you have a question or a comment, and, and you will have the opportunity to write your question or comment uh, in the box on the right of your screen. And when you are uh, writing the question, please also write to who your question is, who to who of the pres presenters. Our editing team will then then post the comments directly on the screen for all us all of us to see. Now, if someone wrote an interesting question or a comment, you may also have the, the opportunity to click thumbs up. This will enable us to see which one you find the most uh, interesting or popular. For the Q&A session, then we will uh, do our best to engage our presenters with the best questions we can we can within our given uh, time limit. Yes, we hope we get a lot of questions. Now, secondly, we would uh, very much like to know um, what you think about the CLIS online conference. And you will see a button in the top right corner of your screen called polls. And uh, please click here after the conference and fill in the short, very short questionnaire. Uh, it is brief and it's a very valuable tool for us and the organizers to uh, assess uh, the success of the conference, uh, the topics and the presentations. And also please to uh, uh, remember to submit your personal assessment. And now we will see and hear the first presenter today. It is Anne de Sandvik, senior scientist at the Institute of Marine Research or IMR in Norway. She will talk about sea, light, sea lice and traffic lights. Anna Sandvik is currently working in the Oceanography and Climate Group at the Institute of Marine Research in Bergen. She has been working with numerical modeling for more than 25 years, and since 2016 she has led uh, uh, the IMR's operational salmon lice model project with the principal responsibility for the model's deliverables from IMR to risk assessment on salmon lice. She has several publications on ocean and lice modeling and risk, ass risk assessment and was a member of the Norwegian Traffic Light Expert Group for Salmon Lice from 2016 to 2020. And so let's start the first presentation of the day. Hi, and thank you for inviting me to Sea Lice 2021 and to give a talk on the Norwegian traffic light system, sea louse dispersion and infection risks. I'm working at the Institute of Marine Research in Norway, in a group where we together has developed the salmon louse and infection risk model system. 
Our group constitutes people who are experts in hydrodynamic modeling, particle tracking modeling, individual-based modeling, salmon louse biology, infection risks, including observations, modeling and risk assessment. Aquaculture of salmonids has more than doubled during the last 20 years and has the potential to continue to become a rapidly growing form of food production to a growing global population. But the growth has to be environmentally sustainable. And sustainability, of course, includes a lot of parameters like genetic impact on wild populations, organic overload, and sustainable production of fish feed. However, at present, the indicator for further growth in Norwegian aquaculture is the salmonized induced mortality on wild salmonids. The Norwegian salmon farming is mainly in open cages. There are more than 1,000 sites located in the fjords and along the coast, while at the moment there are production in about five to six hundreds of these. And the production cycle in sea is about 18 months. To assess whether the production can be increased or not, the Norwegian authorities has implemented the so-called traffic light system, where the coast is divided into 13 production zones. The location of the boundaries are defined based on a hydrodynamic dispersion model to ensure minimum import and export of lice between farms in different zones. Biannually, the impact of salmon lice from farm to wild salmonids is assessed separately within each production zone, where only green light allows for increased production. When modeling salmon louse dispersion, it's important to include knowledge on the salmon louse biology. Adult females hatches their offspring directly into the water masses, and the hatching rate is tightly linked to the water temperature. Thus, the newly hatched offspring are drifting around until they molt to infective louse larvae and can attach to a wild or farmed salmon. For example, at 10 degrees, they have the potential to drift and find a host for about two weeks. This means that they can find a host far away from where they were released into the water masses. And therefore, it's important to have high quality information about water currents, temperature and salinity in the three spatial dimensions and time. The abundance of infective salmon louse larvae are estimated by a coupled information. The release of offspring is estimated from reports on number of fish and number of lice per fish by the industry. Three-dimensional information on water currents, temperature and salinity are estimated by the hydrodynamic model. And the salmon louse offspring are transported by the particle tracking model combined with the salmon louse biology model. The results is daily concentration of infective larvae along the Norwegian coast and fjords, as seen in the example to the right. The daily variability in the planktonic salmon louse concentration along the coast is normally high. For example, in weather situations with onshore wind, the lice is flushed into the coast and fjords, giving high concentrations due to the limited areas inside the fjords while offshore winds can flush the lice out of the fjords and into the open sea, giving lower concentrations. Thus, the salmon lice pressure on wild salmonids will be quite different depending on the physical conditions. The dispersion of louse will also differ between the sites. Here is an example of the monthly average dispersion from two sites at the west coast of Norway. As you can see, the dispersion from the infjord site in the left panels gives higher concentrations than the dispersion from the offshore site in the right panels. Also important is the interannual variability, which shows that, for example, postmolt migrating from the Etna River will swim through higher concentration dispersed from the infjord site in 2018 than in 2019 while the offshore site will contribute to the salmon lice pressure inside the fjord some years, while not in others. 
To estimate the impact of a given concentration of salmon lice larvae in the water masses, we have developed two methods where observations of lice on smolt in sentinel cages and lice on wild postmolt caught by trawl are used to find the relation between the dose in the water masses and infection on the fish. The calibration against data from sentinel cages is an area-based method called the rock method, where the production zone maps are colored red, yellow and green in accordance with defined risk. The relative size of these areas are further used to define the rock index. If the rock index becomes higher than 10, the impact of salmon lice on wild salmonids is considered to be moderate and high if the, in the index is above 30. This is an objective method which also can be used to discuss variation between years and serve as a tool for farmers in the area. The other method is called the virtual postmolt model and was developed through calibration against lice on wild postmolt caught by trawl and where we know their home river from genetic assignment. In this model, the postmolt swim through the dynamic salmon lice concentration fields while an estimated proportion attached to the virtual postmolt. The total number of lice on the fish is counted when they reach the ocean and the mortality is estimated from given tolerance limits. For use in a risk assessment, like the traffic light system, the mortality is estimated for all the salmon rivers in Norway, where a mortality below 10 is classified as low and above 30 as high. The mean value between the rivers within the production zone can be estimated and the annual variability shown as the pi diagram to the right. Putting this information together with other model products and field observations, the Norwegian authorities concluded in 2019 that production must be reduced in two production zones, could continue at the present level in two and could increase in the other nine. As you can see from the colouring in 2017 to the left, this was an improvement for farmers in production zone 2, 3 and 6, but for farmers in production zone 5 and 10, the salmon lice pressure had increased between the two assessments. At the moment, the assessment for 2020 and 2021 is ongoing and will be finished by the end of the year. As farmers in the red and yellow zones are eager to become green, there is a lot of ongoing work on how to minimize the lice from on farmed fish and dispersion to wild salmonids. A future growth in the aquaculture production and those important food for a growing world population is only possible through close cooperation between science, industry and the management authorities. Ongoing projects to obtain the goal of sustainable growth includes increased knowledge on lice biology, shorter production cycle in sea, identifying dispersion fire breaks and networks, and new barrier technology in interaction with the physical and environmental conditions. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Anna Sandwick. We will be hearing more from you later when the question and answer session begins. This is also a reminder to you all watching that you can write your comments or questions on the right, uh, on, on your screen and send it to us. Our next speaker is Tonje C. Osmundsen. She will be talking about the wheel of sustainability. Tony is a very experienced scientist. She has studied in Norway, France and Spain with an emphasis on political science, international politics and social anthropology. In a paper from uh, 2020, Sonia raises questions about how sustain sustainability certification has become an increasingly important feature in aquaculture production, leading to a multitude of regimes with various criteria. However, the large number of regimes and the com complexity of the standard cr standards create confusion with respect to which sustainability objectives are targeted. So, what is meant by sustainability is unclear. I look very much forward to hearing your presentation.
Good day. My name is Tonja Osmundsen. I'm a research professor at Antenu Samfunnsforskning here in Trondheim, Norway. Grateful to be able to be with you today. My, the title of my presentation is Salmon Lies as Governmental Technology. And I'm starting this presentation in a very different place than what is common in most conferences in the aquaculture sector by introducing this man, Michel Foucault a very important French philosopher and scholar. He's best known for his studies of power and how power is exercised through social institutions. Among other things, he showed us how we, how society, through laws and rules, norms and values, reward and punishment, have multiple ways of disciplining ourselves and others to behave in a certain manner in order to create a predictable and orderly society. One of the ways we regulate our own behavior is through the means of regulatory technology. Such technologies function even though there is not any constant supervision or frequent control, simply because we either believe it's the right way to behave and because we know that someone might control or check if we are complying. Regulatory technologies may be different ways of reporting where set indicators measure the status of something, whether what we report is below or above, above what is expected. In order to discipline ourselves and others, we often use indicators which rely on counting something. This is, among other things, the core of what is called new public management where the use of indicators are very popular, but also heavily criticized. If you have an indicator which tells you when something is going well or badly, it provides a very effective way to monitor the condition of something, completely without the need to inspect or control, because it's the citizen, him or herself, who reports on how things are going. And it's against such a background that I'm returning to the salmon lice. The salmon lice here illustrated with uh, one of its more distant relatives is most commonly understood as an animal and a parasite. But here I am inviting you to think about the louse as a regulatory technology, an instrument which steers the aquaculture industry in the desired direction towards control with the numbers of lice in their pens on the farm salmon, and not the least towards reducing the number of lice that may infect, pa uh, infect passing wild salmonites. As a regulatory instrument, the Laos is here understood as a tool that disciplines the industry in a sustainable direction. In the Norwegian public, uh, aquaculture regulation, salmon lice have been given a very prominent role and has had an impressive political career since 2009 from when it first entered into public regulation. Counting lice on farmed salmon in neck cages have been mandatory since then. The Laos has both hailed uh, the issuing of new licenses until 2013 and been central in the issuing of new licenses, the so-called green licenses and the development licenses in 2013 and 2015, uh, where the objective of these licenses was to reduce the problems with the lice. As we know, salmon lice negatively affects both wild and foreign salmon, and it is important to control. But the reduction of lice number also plays a role in realizing political ambitions. It's in the interest of the, at the time, current government to demonstrate political will and power to handle the problems of the agriculture industry. So they want to demonstrate that they are resourceful in their endeavors to regulate the industry. It is obvious that the establishment of, a salmon lice, of the salmon lice as a regulatory tool follows very clearly the recipe of Michel Foucault. In more and more ways, a system of reward and punishment 
has been built around the results of lice counts. And it makes the lies absolutely central in disciplining the industry. But this has both positive and negative consequences. Because lice are a big problem both inside and outside the cage, it's important to know the amount of lice, but it is also a very suitable proxy. It gives us a way to measure something by measuring something else. We measure the number of salmon lice in the cage to find out how much the wild salmon can be affected. At the same time, it is also an indication of how well the farm sal farmed salmon are doing in the cage, so of fish welfare. And it serves as a measurement of sustainability and gives us at least a partial picture of how environmentally sustainable production is. The lice is a suitable proxy because it is at least fairly easy to count. And when it comes to regulatory technologies, counting is very important. Quantitative results versus qualitative, meaning descriptions of conditions are preferable because they are more credible. Figures are perceived more objectively and true than qualitative descriptions, although they may be richer and give a more complete picture of something. Numbers are comparable across place and over time. They make it possible to, to compare those who have bad behavior and those who succeed. Such comparisons are also easy to publish so that further pressure is placed on the players to conform to the system. It also serves as a yardstick. They show where the result is on a scale from bad to good and what you have to do or how, how much you have to improve. Counting and reporting numbers can also be decentralized. The lies is thus counted by the industry itself without the government having to do the job or take the bill. In addition, you can control counts in case you suspect that someone is cheating. When a regulatory technology is well established, it is often accepted, well accepted by most parties, and there's little discussion about it. But during the process where it's being introduced and developed, there's often a very intense discussion about both knowledge and political interest. There is often a resistance against the establishment of a regulatory technology because it has consequences for what will be emphasized and what will not be considered important. If we look back on the debate on salmon lice over the last 10 to 15 years, there has been much disagreement concerning the facts and knowledge about the lice and the impact it has on wild salmon. In Norway, we also had a debate about who should manage salmon lice, whether it should be the Norwegian Food Safety Authority, the county governor, or the director of fisheries. So both the status and validity of knowledge were highly debated, and the role of the various governmental authorities. There are some who will gain power, and others who will lose power when such a tool is established. There are different consequences, and one is that it simplifies reality. In Norway's newly established production areas, it's only the number of salmon lights reported that determines whether farms in the area may increase production or not. And not, not all the other conditions that are also very important for whether one operates sustainably affect wild salmon, have good fish welfare, be it mortality, growth, good environmental conditions, et cetera, et cetera. The other consequence is black boxing. That is the focus on the regulatory technology means that you hide other factors, other complicated connections. For example, the uncertainty of the count, the impact from surrounding facilities, the importance of temperatures, brackish water, and you conceal that it has consequences financially or consequences for the cleaner fish, or consequences for the farmed fish in terms of stress and handling. 
salmon lice appear to be an objective and neutral indicator of the farming industry's impact on the environment. But all the uncertainty, assumptions, reservations, and assessments are hidden when the indicator gets the role it has in disciplining the industry. And the public gets the impression that counting salmon lice is as easy as counting marbles. And when the industry does not get control of the lice problem, it's solely due to their unwillingness to fix the problem. Another consequence is that it distributes responsibility and power. And the industry receives the full responsibility for the salmon lice, and in many ways that's appropriate, but they also get responsibility for conditions beyond their control. For example, infections from neighboring facilities, the location of facilities along the coast, the amount of allowed biomass in pressured areas. But lice also distributes power. In this case, especially to the ministry and the director of fisheries, which can now regulate the amount of biomass in pressured areas. The focus and importance of the pro lice problem means that other issues tend to fall out of focus. Time and energy spent counting lice and treating against lines means that other problems do not receive similar attention, be it diseases, animal welfare, escapes, and other issues. And finally, the importance of controlling lies is very important for the credibility and social legitimacy of the industry. Controlling lies becomes far more important than the many, many negative consequences this has for cleaner fish and for reduced fish welfare. Finally, I should emphasize that using salmon lice as a regulatory technology is not in itself bad, but enormous and one-sided emphasis on one indicator uh, gives us problems. If several indicators had been established, which together would still have meant a simplified representation of reality, it could at least have given a better and a bit more complete picture of the situation where it would be possible to weigh different negative consequences against one another instead of the current situation where all the focus is on the one protagonist on the center stage, the Laos. Thank you very much for listening in. If you would like to read more about this, this paper is also published open access. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tonya, for your enlightening presentation. The next speaker is Bengt Finstad. Bengt is holding a DNV professorship at aquaculture, in aquaculture biology at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. His working areas include uh, um, ecophysiology, aquaculture, small production, release of fish, welfare and stress, pollution and other human impacts, salmonids at sea, fish diseases and parasites, and biotelemetry. Bengt is project leader and project partner on several projects, including field and laboratory studies on fish, environmental monitoring, and fish population monitoring. We will now hear his talk about aquaculture and wild fish interactions. Take it away, Bengt. Are you ready, Bengt? Yeah, I'm a bit of mute in your in your Zoom. For your presentation. Okay. Mm. Now you 
han här. Jag tror att du får göra med. Yes. Hello everybody. Uh, greetings from uh, from Norway and this is Norway Norway live. Uh, today I will uh, uh, lead you to uh, aquaculture and wild fish interactions. Uh, the speak is in 10 minutes, so it's a shortage of time, but I will uh, try to go to uh, four or five different points uh, regarding this topic here. Just to have a background for uh, the sources for sea lice. Uh, the sea lice uh, come from fish in fish farms. Sea lice also originates from escapees, escaped farm salmon, and from wild fish. We also have uh, the effect of environmental factors as salinity and temperature. High temperature will uh, increase the development of sea lice and uh, vice versa, low temperature will decrease the development. But all these will lead to infected copepodids, which will infest uh, the Atlantic salmon smolt, or Arctic char and uh, sea trout in the marine environment. So just to, to bring you back to uh, some historical data, what was the natural infection system for sea lice? We knew that uh, previously that the very few hosts were available for sea lice along the coastline in the winter period. Atlantic salmon were feeding in the open ocean, sea toad and Arctic char are mostly spending the winter in fresh water. So therefore, the infection pressure on fjord migrating postmolts were therefore very limited and mostly derived from ascending adult salmon. And in the natural system, sea lice slowly and gradually aggregate on coastal feeding salmonids, and the infection usually peaks at 4.28 lice late in the autumn. That was a historical uh, uh, version there. Then we got the changing regime for uh, sea lice. Uh, we know from the late 70s that sea lice became an increasing problem in fish farms. All the new hosts changed the sea lice population, and this is numbers from, from Norway. The total number of wild salmonids, Atlantic salmon, sea trout, and Arctic char, uh, were approximately 2.5 million individuals. And of these, 481,000 wild Atlantic salmon in 2019. And uh, what is important here is that this species stays in fjord system for only a few months. And the total biomass of farmed salmonids in sea is approximately 1.3 million tons. That is 400 million individuals. So there are therefore several hundred times more hosts available for sea lice compared to the situation before salmon farming began. This is uh, a video showing you um, uh, premature returning sea trout in Norway, uh, in the middle part of Norway. And you can see that the fish are seeking back to fresh water and brackish water to delos to get rid of lice. And they are staying there for one to two weeks to get rid of lice, and then they migrate out in the open ocean again. So the menu for this uh, speak today is uh, to look at physiological effects, field studies, population effects, behavioral effects, and uh, briefly going to mention the traffic light system, which uh, on the Sunday presented as the first speaker. Uh, to go to the physiological effects of laboratory studies on uh, sea lice on Atlantic salmon, uh, sea trout and Arctic char, we have done a lot of experiments. And uh, just to give you one example here is uh, when we have followed uh, the salmon smolts in a, in a tank, they have been infested by copepodids of sea lice and followed until the sea lice has uh, increased or de um, developed to adult lice. And we see from the left uh, hand side uh, uh, slide here that uh, the stress level uh, explained as cortisol is, uh, is normal in uninfested fish. But in the infested fish, which has uh, got uh, sea lice infestation, we see that the stress levels is increasing during the, the trial from copodit to adult lice on the fish. And for the seawater tolerance, which you see on the right hand side, we see that uh, uninfested fish have a normal chloride level, a normal seawater tolerance uh, during this trial. 
but uh, the infested fish have an increasing chloride level. That is, they have a decreased seawater tolerance and the fish starting to die at uh, uh, 21 days post-infection when the sea lice develops to mobile stages. So out of these experiments and uh, several others, we have, um, uh, we have calculated the in initial physiologic responses at, at uh, more than 1.1 uh, lice per gram fish weight is decreasing the, the fish ability and uh, resulting in a negative uh, physiological imbalance. We have done a lot of field studies here in Norway, and uh, there's also a lot of field studies both in Ireland and Scotland and, and other countries. But um, just to give you a brief overview of what is done in Norway, we see that um, from the southern part of Norway to the northern part of Norway, there have been a lot of uh, gill netting after wild fish to estimate the sea lice level on the fish. We have also done a lot of bag netting of the fish and um, electrofishing and trolling after Atlantic salmon uh, postmolds. So due to these field studies, we have got a good uh, view of uh, the sea lice level on, on the wild fish in uh, Norway and relate this to, to the fish farming activity and the density of sea lice in the fjord systems. Now this figure here shows uh, the accumulated daily production of live stages um, in a, in a fjord in, in Norway. That is the increased number of sea lice, as you see on the, on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, you see the mean abundance of lice on wild fish. And um, it's clearly shown, it's a significant correlation between uh, the lice load in the, in the fjord system and the lice load on the fish. So we see that where we have a high, high lice load, there's also a high lice load on the wild fish. And this is also related to, to the aquaculture production, where we have a high density of aquaculture farms. There will be more lice than in the low density or non-farming non areas. So this is also one of the examples showing the, the relationship between sea lice in the fjord systems and sea lice on the wild fish. We have uh, gone into uh, looking at the population effects of uh, sea lice on fish, and this is done by use of releasing experiments. We have, um, we have individual tagged fish by uh, external carlin tags and um, treated one group with a sea lice uh, uh, medication, which uh, prevents sea lice to de develop on the fish and also released un treated fish to look at the difference in survival between these two groups. And we see from, uh, from the experiments here from, from Norway that in most instances, uh, the treated fish have a better recapture rate than untreated fish. So this is also an example showing the effect of sea lice on wild fish. Sea lice will aggregate on the non-protected fish and probably create a higher mortality than the protected fish. And looking at uh, the growth of these fish, which you see in the, in the left hand, uh, in the right hand slide, you see that uh, the treated fish, when they have been out in the sea for, uh, for one year and, and come back to, to the coast, they have a uh, better growth than the untreated fish. So we also see the effect of better recapture of a treated fish and better growth of a, a treated fish. And uh, the growth is actually 6% uh, better than a uh, control group. So this is also an example showing the effect of sea lice on, um, on the populations. And we also have uh, some, uh, some uh, studies from, uh, from um, Ireland, from Paddy Gargan. They have uh, tagged fish by coded wire tags, and they also had treated fish and released fish untreated. And as you see here from this example, uh, the treated smolts uh, had actually 1.8 times more likely to return compared, compared to untreated smolts. So uh, this is a good, good uh, example, both from Ireland and Norway, showing that sea lice have a population reduction effect on, uh, on the wild uh, smolts of Atlantic salmon. Uh, we have also done uh, behavioral uh, studies on, uh, on uh, fish related that to, to sea lice. 
as you saw in the first uh, the video, we saw that the fish uh, sea trout were migrating back to the estuary to delos to get rid of lice. When they have a li high lice level on them, they go back to, uh, to fresh water or brackish water to get rid of lice. And that is not a um, um, behavior Atlantic salmon can do. They, when Atlantic salmon migrate out in the open sea, they get infection by sea lice, but they don't have the effect of going back to, to uh, the estuary and river to, to delos as um, sea trout and also uh, Arctic char have this ability to delos. So what we have done here is uh, that we have, um, we have tagged this sea trout with uh, hydroacoustic tags. And these tags um, will send signals to hydrophones in the in the fjord systems, so we can actually uh, we can actually monitor where the fish are migrating in in this uh, fjord system. Uh, this uh, um, figure here shows um, uh, some of the effects we found of this uh, hydroacoustic tagged fish, and this is from a fjord system in the middle part of Norway where we have. Um, released fish in 2012 at a high production year. That was a high um, aquaculture production in this short system that year. The year after the, the system were followed. So uh, there were no or very little aqu aquaculture activity. And in 2014, the activities increased again. And as you see from the I axis uh, on the left hand side, you see that uh, infection intensity is uh, directly related to to the production uh, from each year. 2012, high production, there's a high lice load on the fish, and 2013, there's a low lice load on the fish. And when we relate this also to, uh, to migration by using these hydroacoustic tags, we see that uh, from the high production year, that trout are, sea trout are actually uh, aggregating closer to the estuary and the river than in the low production year when the fish are um, using more of this uh, fjord system to, to feed. And back to, uh, to 2014, we see that also uh, the fish are uh, aggregating closer to the river system. So uh, the density of, of uh, sea lice in the sea leads to higher, higher um, uh, sea lice level on the fish and also to um, uh, change in the migration pattern of the fish because of uh, having, if you are having a high lice load on the fish, then you will uh, go back to the estuary to to delose and probably lose a lot of uh, the growth in uh, in uh, seawater. And the last thing is the traffic light system, which uh, Anders Sandvik also mentioned in the first uh, uh, presentation. And uh, you see the Norwegian coast is divided into thirteen zones and. Um, the traffic light system is actually uh, based on lice monitoring and, and modeling. So all these data are set together and calculated into this traffic light uh, system here. And you see in uh, 2020, nine areas were defined as green. That means that you can increase the activity by 6%. Two areas as yellow, you have to keep the production at the same level and uh, two uh, areas were defined as red, then you can uh, have to reduce by 6% production. And uh, this is uh, a, a good tool for sustainable fish farming in Norway. And it's used by, um, by the ministry and uh, of fisheries uh, here in Norway. So to sum up this uh, physiological effects, we see that through laboratory studies, we have estimated the effects of sea lice on the fish and we can calculate the lice loads, which uh, will lead to the negative physiological effects on, uh, on the wild fish and also on, on hatchery reared fish. And uh, by field studies, we are doing a live capture of salmonids throughout the Norwegian coast and we can estimate the lice load on the wild fish and uh, make this as a deliverance into the, the results to the to the traffic light system. And population effects, what's the, the initial, uh, initial effect of, uh, on population? We can use this by, um, or study this by uh, releasing uh, treated and untreated fish and look at uh, the, the, the population um, effects on these fish. If they are migrating 
uh, back in, in, in um, lower numbers or in higher numbers for treated fish. And behavioral studies, we can also look at the behavior of the fish relating to, uh, to the migratory behavior. And the last one is the traffic light system, which uh, is a tool for sustainable fish farming used here in Norway. So by this rainbow over the aquaculture net pen, I thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Bank Finstad. We will now hear Taylor Isaac speaking about global and national governance of sea laws management. Taylor Isaac is aquaculture program manager at, uh, manager at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch USA. His special uh, subject in subjects include the sustainable seafood, coastal marine ecosystems, and ecosystem-based education. For the Q&A session later on, after this presentation, Taylor will be joined by Dr. Hilde Tunen of Vajeningen University. Her work in development the, the aquaculture governance indicators, which is a collaboration between Vajeningen and Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch, is the focal point of the Taylor's presentation with respect to sea labs management. So please keep this in mind when you send your questions and comments on the panel. Taylor Isaac. Good afternoon, and thank you for attending my presentation. My name is Tyler Isaac. I'm the Aquaculture Program Manager at Seafood Watch, a program of the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Today, I will give a brief overview of our program and how some of our work relates to the governance of sea lice management. Next slide. Seafood Watch assesses the ecological sustainability of fisheries and aquaculture operations worldwide, and based on those assessments, makes seafood purchasing recommendations to consumers and businesses across North America. Our assessments contain ratings that follow a traffic light system. Green, best choice, yellow, good alternative, and red, avoid. These serve to guide purchasing. We're different than a certification, our assessments are set at the regional or country level. They are non-voluntary yet cost-free, and we do not have on-pack labeling. Next slide. Launched in 1999, our program used a market-based approach, assuming that if enough consumers demanded sustainable seafood, top retailers and food service companies would make public commitments and in turn, to access the lucrative US and EU markets, producers and governments would need to respond. We've since developed business partners like Whole Foods, Aramark, Red Lobster, Cheesecake Factory, and Blue Apron. All of these have made public commitments to sustainable seafood. They continue to be motivated by consumer expectations and a stable supply of seafood. And as a result, global seafood producers are working to meet their purchasing specifications for environmentally and socially responsible seafood. Next slide. Our assessments are produced by deeply researching a sector under scope a combination of species, production system, and geographic region. We seek data from the literature, direct from industry, governments, and industry experts, then apply these data to our aquaculture standard. The 10 criteria are displayed here on the screen. Data, effluent, habitat, chemical use, feed, escapes, disease, source of stock, wildlife mortalities, and introduction of secondary species. The draft assessment is compiled by an analyst and reviewed internally and then externally by experts and the aforementioned stakeholders prior to being finalized. Next slide. The final product is a completed assessment with recommendations contained within. The entire process can take up to two years depending on the complexity of the assessment. Assessments are updated as a procedural matter every four years, though are able to be updated at any time should significant new information arise. Here are the current reports for some major salmon producing countries. Chile, next slide. Canada, next slide. And Norway. Broadly, the major environmental impact areas that we see in net pen salmon production across the world are disease, such as sea lice, and chemicals, such as those antiparasitics used to treat sea lice. Disease is notably a concern in areas where native salmon exist, as farms may act as vectors to wild salmon in these places. Next slide. Our assessments are indeed a great tool at identifying performance gaps and ecological impacts, 
but we also need to understand how to work with sectors to make improvements. Thus, we work to build the Aquaculture Governance Indicators, or AGIs, with Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Next slide. Aquaculture governance is, to quote, a range of social processes and practices involved in solving societal problems and creating societal opportunities through interactions among civil, public, and private actors. Governance is not limited to legislation, of course, and we sought to assess aquaculture governance through analyzing the ways in which regulatory systems, voluntary codes and standards, and joint projects and activities are organized around the identification of environmental issues and response to solving problems. Next slide. In this way, we obtain a better understanding of the abilities of the sector to deal with sustainability challenges. Next slide as well as identify gaps in governance systems so as to effectively implement or guide improvement efforts. Next slide. The AGI framework considers that governance is comprised of four dimensions, legislation or codified laws, rules, and regulations, voluntary codes and standards, such as the ASC, BAP, or third-party management standards like ISO 14001, collaborative arrangements, defined as an organized group of actors with different rights, interests, and responsibilities, and capabilities, or the ability of key actors to observe, define, and understand problems, and act or react in an appropriate way. These dimensions are underpinned by three overarching normative principles, legitimacy, or the degree to which rules are seen as legitimate to all, effectuation, the implementation and enactment of a governance arrangement through procedures, and coordination, the degree to which governance arrangements coordinate in their wider institutional environment to ensure consistency and or complementarity. Next slide. Effectively, collaborative arrangements and capabilities may be understood as inputs to the outputs of legislation and voluntary codes and standards. Through the use of the AGI framework, we can develop an understanding of the relative strengths and weaknesses of the governance of a particular aquaculture sector, we often think of governance as a set of rules or a set of criteria in a standard, yet the AGIs help us understand and assess what is going on behind the scenes. What are the capabilities of the organizations involved? Is there collaboration? Are activities coordin coordinated well, et cetera? An assessment requires significant research and communication with stakeholders and scoring is completed following the methodology outlined in the AGI handbook. Please visit the website, aquaculturegovernance.org, for a much more thorough explanation of this framework. Resources such as the methodology, as well as the results for a number of sectors. I've compiled a summary of the major salmon producing sectors again, Canada, Chile, and Norway, and note the major takeaways and how they relate to sea lice. Next slide. Here we have Canada. Next slide. Chile. Next slide. And Norway. Next slide. To compare, you'll notice that the lowest performing dimensions across the sectors are voluntary codes and standards and collaborative arrangements. And within these, the principle of coordination is notably lower than the other principles. Next slide. So what are the major takeaways? Of course, it must be noted that context is important and these are just the overarching themes. For details, please read the profiles for each sector found on the website noted previously. However, overall, salmon aquaculture governance features well-developed and enforced regulatory structures with high marks in legislation. Similarly, the industry is highly capable of identifying, reacting to, and solving environmental challenges. Yet in some sectors, there are challenges with respect to resource availability and varying levels of, tr of trust among stakeholders that limit effective collaboration. Governance is perceived as highly legitimate across all the dimensions, Yet, as mentioned, particularly low coordination within voluntary codes and standards and collaborative arrangements. These gaps appear to be primarily driven by challenges in assessing and managing the cumulative impacts at regional scales associated with a number of impact areas, including sea lice. Next slide. How can we thus apply this understanding to lice management? Increasing coordination between voluntary codes and standards, such as ASC and BAP, both between themselves and between those codes and the regulatory bodies and industry actors present in a country can help to align expectations regarding sustainable sea lice thresholds and chemical treatments. Better inclusion of civil society actors, such as environmental NGOs and local communities or organizations, 
is important to ensure that all voices are heard with respect to defining sustainable life thresholds, acceptable management measures, and more. Broadly, and perhaps most importantly, the industry can move to better address cumulative regional impacts associated with sea lice. Individual farm sites may control lice to levels compliant with regulations and or voluntary codes, yet the cumulative regional pressure to wild salmonids due to sea lice on farm can be significant. Similarly, individual farm sites may apply chemical treatments compliant with these governance schemes, yet the cumulative impact of these compounds entering the environment may have significant impacts to ecosystem functionality. Moving legislation towards ecosystem-based management and working to internalize the external environmental and social costs associated with sea lice and their treatment will serve to reduce these impacts and improve the performance and reputation of the salmon industry. Next slide. Many thanks again for your time and attention. I'm looking forward to discussing this further in the panel alongside my colleague from Wageningen University, Dr. Hildi Tunin. Please feel free to reach out with any questions and I'm looking forward to speaking with you. Thank you. We thank Tyler Isaac and uh, are looking forward to hearing both uh, him and Dr. Tunin in the Q&A later. And as he said, you're welcome to send questions. Um, yeah, and they'll take it up later. Our final speaker in this session is Felipe Tuca Diaz, who speaks about antiparasitic treatments and potential environmental risks. Dr. Felipe Tuca is a marine bio biologist and PhD in environmental sciences with specialization in aquatic ecosystems at the University of Conception. Currently, Dr. Tuca is working in in the Salmon Industry Technological in Chile as a research coordinator uh, to support the salmon industry activity on environmental topics. During the last years, he has worked on ecological risk assessment procedures with a greater interest in chemicals of emerging concern. Also, his expertise has been focused to understand the dynamic and fate of chemicals released to the environment where models where modeling tools and passive samplers in water have been designed along with his studies in the field. Uh, he has been working since 2007 in diverse scientific and public projects related to emerging uh, contaminants, ocean acid acidification, passive sampling in water, aquaculture and ecological risk assessment of pesticides. And here is uh, Philippe Tuca Diaz's uh, presentation. Good afternoon. Uh, in this opportunity, I will show my presentation titled Antiparasitic Treatment and Potential Environmental Risk. Uh, the Calibus rickettsii is the common ectoparasite disease in the southern Chile. Uh, this parasite produces hemorrhage, skin damage, uh, secondary infection, mortality, and important economic losses in the salmon industry. For this, uh, pharmaceutical alternative uh, the in industry used to trade or to combat this ectoparasite uh, in, in salmon. The option are asametifos. In, uh, the option in Chile are asametifos, exaflumulon, uh, cypermetrin, deltametrin, and other one uh, added in feed like uh, emamectin benzoate. Uh, Diflovenzuron and Lufenuron. Now, in the context of this presentation, it's important to understand what means environmental risk. Environmental risks try to establish a potential relation between exposure assessment and effect assessment uh, after uh, the risk characterization is, is defined to determine risk uh, in, the, in, the, in the marine environment in this case. The monitoring uh, is a good tool to define exposure assessment uh, because in which experience we determine a major environmental concentration. Uh, if we have a, a concentration higher than toxicity, it's possible to define risk in the marine environment. For this, the, the weight the weight of evidence is very important and different lines of evidence that we use in our experience in Chile 
uh, how was determined with, by monitoring and literature uh, information. The literature information was important to define the ecotoxicological database and uh, then compare, in comparison with the environmental concentration in the monitoring. Now, uh, the study case in Chile uh, was performed in four salmon cages, in four salmon, salmon farms, sorry, uh, where the was, was possible to coordinate the sampling around the salmon cages when the treatment with the pyrethroid was performed in, in field. Here uh, in Los Lagos region, uh, was collect uh, water and sediment sample, but also uh, we use a cross sampling strategy to define a distribution of the chemicals around the salmon cages. Uh, in this opportunity, we use a uh, Lagrangian tracer to define current, uh, dominant current in, in, the, in each uh, study area. And also we use a, a passive samplers to define the uh, dissolved fraction in the water column. The passive sampler based on a copolymer, copolymer ethyl vinyl acetate around the salmon cages was located uh, around the salmon cages to define the major environmental concentration in water. Uh, with respect, with regard to the result in this study, uh, uh, the in sediment concentration of the cypermetrine and delta metrine uh, was found uh, between four and six nanogram per gram dry weight uh, of the the residual pyrethroid in 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 field. Uh, in the other case, sorry. Uh, in the other case, when we we see the the, the spatial distribu distribution of the chemicals in, around the salmon cages, it's possible to determine different distribution. When a red color represents the higher concentration of the cypermetrine or delta metrine in field, uh, it's important to recognize recognize. Uh, the, the this concentration depend of the uh, velocity currents uh, um, deep in in each study area when you use this strategy. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we regard to the the seawater concentration. It's possible uh, the concentration was a uh, reach a uh, maximum between 13 and four nanogram per, per, uh, per liter. Uh, when, if we, if we use a si simple uh, exercises in, 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 in with res regard to ecotoxicological information and range uh, to find in, in field, it's possible to see the cypermethrine represent a risk uh, close to salmon cages in, 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 in field, mainly uh, on crustacean organisms. Uh, in relation to delta metrine, this concentration were, uh, were uh, lower than uh, sensitivity of uh, seawater organisms. Now, when, when we use the similar exercises, uh, with uh, benthic organisms, benthic organisms, these biocides are represent a uh, sediment biocide uh, in, in, in laboratory. Uh, cypermetrine show a uh, concentration or range of concentration lower than sensitivity in, in, uh, uh, of benthic organisms, but the benthic organisms, organisms could be most vulnerable to delta metrine action because the range uh, detected in, in, in bottom sediment uh, is higher than threshold of the uh, some species, sensitivity species. Now, uh, however, measured concentration of cypermetrine 
uh, or in this case, should be considered with a caution uh, to be defined case to case because if we use a range of the previous campaign in, in other salmon cages, the concentration are higher than sensitivity to many uh, benthic species. Now, about the learned lesson of, in this study, uh, it's important to understand under realistic and complex scenarios the exposure of antiparasitic chemicals on marine organisms, because the time of the exposure and concentration are dynamic, and any time they no represent la, uh, lab test. Uh, on the other hand, mucho, many of the uh, environmental conditions are site-specific. It was possible to look in the uh, spatial uh, deposition of the peritroids around the salmon cages. Because the variability in terms of the concentration measure depend on the sampling period and monitoring strategy. Uh, when we use the passive sampling, was a, a, a feasible tools, feasible tools to detect peritroid levels in the seawater. Now, what is the future consideration or the challenge in the future of the this kind of a study? Uh, it's important to knowledge about the behavior of chemical. Okay, uh, the develop of in situ ecotoxicological tests for a better understanding of the realistic effect in non-organic species, especial, especially with uh, crustacean species. Um, it's important to move to uh, toward an ecosystem ecosystemic view uh, because uh, currently uh, the, the population is increasing. Uh, we have a uh, many sources of pollutant of emerging concerns uh, that the interaction between different chemicals increasing the, the effect in the, in the ecosystem could be increasing uh, effect in the ecosystem. Uh, the climate change with, uh, if we define with the ocean acidification, uh, temperature and oxygen variable, uh, the chemical depend of this variable um, behavior on effect the, uh, of this chemical depend on the, 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 the change, environmental change. Uh, so it's important to the relation between natural changes and uh, chemical variables uh, in, the, in, the, in the environment. Uh, on the other hand, the, the long-term surveillance of chemicals is important and collaborative participation between diverse disciplines uh, like ecotoxicologists, eco eco chemists, and uh, ecologists is very important to define a uh, well study relation to risk in the environment. Thank you very much. Dr. Felipe Tuka. We will now, uh, now, th now, this was the final presentation of, uh, of the session uh, about environmental impact of societal, societal uh, responsibility. Uh, we, sh we shall have now all five presenters wi with us on Zoom and Dr. Tunan as well, who will take questions along with Taylor Isaac. So, our presenters are already online, ready to take questions and comments from you, the viewers. But also, our presenters will have the opportunity to engage each other here online. Yes, and uh, the first question is for uh, the anonymous question for Anna Sandvik. Uh, what is the largest uncertainty in your sea louse dispersion model? Thank you. That's an uh, interesting question. Yes. <laughs> and um, yeah, I could have been talking about it for hours, I think. But I think maybe the largest uncertainty is uh, the countings uh, which are done at the fish farms. 
they are counting uh, lice on 20 salmon once a week and then they report it to the Norwegian authorities. And, uh, but they, they don't need to, uh, to, to tell which day in the week they counted. So it could be counted mm -hmm. on Monday or on the following Sunday. So, so there is a, is an uncertainty in addition to the, that, that maybe the, the numbers uh, could have been improved if they had counted on more fish or uh, they are also working with uh, automatically counting. So maybe that can improve uh, that part. And um, another uncertainty or, uh, is uh, the sensitivity to salinity because the salmon lungs are very sensitive to, uh, to salinity and the salinity in the Norwegian fjords or in the range where some salmon lungs starts to sink or swim downwards. So small variability in salinity can, can um, can push the, the, the salmon lice down and uh, away from the wild salmonids. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And we have a second question, a question for Anne as well. And that is, do the models correspond well with the observed data in wild fish and farmed? Yes, we have, um, we have uh, actually, we have three publications on that. We have, uh, we have on the uh, we, we have done a validation against the uh, salmon lice on um, from sentinel cages, which uh, shows that there is a large agreement between the salmon lice dispersion model and uh, and the, the number of lice on the fish in the sentinel cages, and we have another on wild catch the trout, which also showed that this uh, it's a um, yeah, high correspondence. And as Bengt uh, also pointed to a publication from 2014, from uh, where we also show that there is a, is a correspondence. When it's come to uh, to the to to, to uh, his comparison with uh, on farm fish, then it's much more difficult because we don't have those numbers because there is a lot of uh, delousing going on and, and so on. So, so so that's and and counting the the very very small uh, stages of salmon lice is uh, is. Uh, I don't think we can rely on those countings, so, so we haven't done that comparison. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question uh, to Bengt. How effective were your sentinel cage surveys for determining regional lice numbers? Uh, the, the sentinel cages, uh, they are uh, placed in the sea and they have uh, smolts, uh, smolts as attractants to sea lice. And um, we see that you can't, you can't account for the, the whole uh, sea lice spread, but you can see the variation between a high and low density area of uh, sea lice. And that's exactly what Anna also mentioned, that uh, we are calibrating the the sentinel cages against uh, the models from uh, from the lice spread, and this is uh, pretty good uh, predictions between the observed and the modeled um, lice spread. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And here is also a question to to Bengt, which says: Using the data from different years, can we identify the relationship between site lice counts? Or proximity to farms and wild population effects. Yeah, uh, in a, in a way, we uh, we have we have I presented a study from Hardangerfjord where we have um, have, have uh, this following 2012 and 2013, and then uh, back to production in 2014. So it's it's um, it's a pretty good uh, correlation between uh, the. The implementation done in the in the fjord systems by the uh, the following and the sea lice on the fish, if that was the the question I uh, was asked. I think that covers it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we have here to uh, Mr. Isaac. Um, what's different in this certification regarding to the multiple other that already exist? Thanks for that question. Um, I'm assuming this is about the Seafood Watch program itself, not necessarily the governance indicators. Now, governance indicators are a separate project of ours that um, we worked with Wageningen University about um, and is more of a gap analysis than anything else. The Seafood Watch program itself 
has been around since 1999. Um, and it's not a certification, it's a ratings program. And so the primary difference between those, as I mentioned, is that we are a non-voluntary program and we assess the seafood that is being consumed by our uh, business partners, as well as consumers throughout North America, dominated by the US market. Um, certifications, on the other hand, are, are voluntary. They require field audits um, and have you know, considerations for things like continued improvement throughout their criteria. Um, we assess current performance. Much of our work okay. is through desktop um, and personal communications, working through the literature. Um, but we have about 80 to 85% of the US market assessed in terms of seafood and over 95% of the, the seafood that's farmed um, and found on the US market as well. So uh, broadly very similar, we interact with eco certifications quite closely, but um, we are a ratings program and uh, a little bit different. Thank you. And we have an excuse from Tony Osmussen. Uh, unfortunately, is, she's not able to join us here. Yeah. And uh, there's a question to Taylor Isaac again. Yes. Uh, what is the role of science in the governance or health aspects such as sea lice? Um, well, thanks for that question as well. I can give a, a very simple answer, and I think Hilda may uh, have some additional insight with respect to how science plays into the governance indicators. Um, but broadly, you know, science plays a key role in helping inform thresholds or, or any limits to production or characteristics of production that may take place, such as, um, you know, things like stocking density, stocking times. Um, clearly, there's epidemiology at play, at spatio-temporal scales here. Um, so understanding simple things like, like how many lice can be on a fish. Um, the, the salmon industry clearly does a, a very good job of this already, but it's still a problem as sea lice are a considerable issue here. Um, but I think science also plays a key role in informing the capability of governance systems and the ability to transfer knowledge from research into practice. Um, and Hilda, if, you, if you'd like to elaborate that, that'd be great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for this question. Yeah, well, within our within our framework, so within looking at, well, assessing what is the aquaculture governance uh, performance, so the performance of the sector and a country's government to actually address the problems such as sea lice within, uh, within salmon. Um, well, we, we see, we, in our assessment, we see that the uh, salmon farming uh, uh, countries have science-based policies. So we, we see that this kind of, uh, that science is being uh, anchored within within the policies, it's requested. Also, uh, many of the international standards rely on well, most rely on on science uh, science based uh, uh, well science knowledge scientific knowledge. However, within our a collaborative arrangement, we also look into to what extent scientists are included in. Uh, discussions about problems and in define, defining problems and also in, in the salmon countries we see that actually they have a role um, and they are taking very seriously uh, taking in to, to define uh, what are the problems but also what are solutions uh, so and that indeed as, as, as Tyler already said that informs and also enhances the capabilities of others like industry and government um, and also NGOs to actually um, work on their own cap capabilities or ability to address problems and to reflect what else should be done uh, in order to uh, to address problems. So, well, this is this is a bit different. For example, if we look at the shrimp producing countries, uh, uh, but yeah, well, within the governance of of of, of salmon, uh, um, we we see that science has a has a, a really important role to play. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, there is a question to Tuka Diaz. How do you evaluate the possibility of an accumulative effect over time compared to acute toxicity on non-target organisms? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, it, it's, it, it's very hard to define accumulative uh, concentration because each chemical 
have a degradation on over time. Uh, maybe is we have a, a long term surveillance of chemical uh, during and after to treatment is possible to define if a uh, cumulative concentration and toxic toxic effect in the ecosystem. But uh, in our experience, we don't have uh, the long term long term surveillance in, in for monitoring. But it's it's very hard to to respond this this question. Yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. We have a question here for uh, Philippe. Mm -hmm. Has there been monitoring of other of the other bath treatments in water or sediments? Yeah, um, in, in Chile we have only experience about but pirate pyrethroids uh, because uh, the pyrethroids uh, was questioned for using for salmon farm. Uh, for other factor, uh, in, in this case, just we have uh, experience in with parathroid, but other chemical, no, no, we don't have experience or other uh, notification of environmental concentration in in, in field. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. And as Ilif said, uh, Tonya couldn't be here, so we have time for some questions, some more questions for you. Um, the top question at the moment is for uh, Anna. Um, how big do fire breaks have to be to be effective? Yes, um, <coughs> well, that will depend on the on the currents and the strength of the currents. So that could be quite uh, different. And if you're looking at the uh, Faroe Islands, for instance, I think maybe Trondo tomorrow will show us that the it could be spread all around the islands. And also along the Norwegian coast, there is uh, the coastal current. The transporting lies far away. So they have to be, to be uh, far away to be effective. But of course, the farther away, the, uh, the reduction, it will help anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so it's so, yeah. And we have a question to Bengt. Are there any difference in stress reaction between salmon, trout, and char? That was a really good question. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say that. We have a lot of uh, experiments done on uh, both Atlantic salmon and, uh, and sea trout. Uh, looking at the stress response, so that's quite quite similar. And we have, um, I think we had two or three uh, studies done on Arctic char, and they actually show the same, uh, the same response. We know that Arctic char, they have, um, they have a smaller scales, they are more susceptible for, uh, for sea lice, but the response both to stress and uh, osmoregulatory uh, competence is, is the same in the three species. Mm -hmm. Very good, thank you. Then I think we have time for one more question. We have a lot of questions here, but um, Tyler Isaac, does this framework consider fish welfare and how is that traded off against chemical delousing treatments? Awesome. Um, that's a great question. Also, thank you. Um, I'd say not directly. No, we, we don't consider fish welfare. Um, broadly, the focus of our assessments is the direct ecological impacts associated with aquaculture production. Um, I will say that we've frequently found that farm and industry practices that work to reduce disease or in turn chemical usage are often practices that increase or promote fish welfare, such as uh, increased or rather reduced stocking densities, the, the use of uh, appropriate feeds, reducing the stress of the fish. Um, so. They're clearly linked, and as noted, there are trade-offs, but we don't assess the, the fish welfare component, um, at least directly. Yeah, Thank I, you very much. Thank you. I'm afraid that we have to stop this Q&A session now. Thank you uh, for, all our, for, for all your questions and comments, and thank you to you, the presenters, for, pre for participating live online. 
and thank you f for your good comments and thoughts to sh uh, you, had, you shared with us. Yeah, um, it's been really good. Uh, before we go to the next item on our agenda, the CLI's online conference would like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsors. This conference would not be possible without their support and sponsorship. So first, the companies sponsoring 10-minute presentations, as you see on the screen, Benchmark Animal Health and Hidden Fjord. Then the companies sponsoring five minutes presentations are Bakavrost, Elanco um, Animal Health and Movi. And the other sponsors are the municipality of Taushan and the Taushan Evening School. Today, our sponsored presentation is from Hidden Fjord. Uh, Espern Pertersson is a Master of Engineering and works at Hidden Fjord, and this is his presentation. Yeah. Hello, my name is Espern Pertersson. I'm a biological developer at Hidden Fjord. I'm going to talk about uh, sea lice and how we handle sea lice at Hidden Fjord. A brief introduction to Hidden Fjord. These are the two owners and managers of Hidden Fjord, Atle and Regen Gregersen. It's a family owned uh, company with roots all the way back to 1887. And we started farming in 1982, and we now have 200 employees. Our philosophy. Um, we have some values, uh, sustainability, to be open and honest, innovation and financial prudence. Then we have some goals to do ours so that uh, farming in the Faroe Islands can reach its full potential, to produce the world's best salmon and be a good workplace. Hidden Fjord is located in the west in the Faroes, where we have six uh, sea farming sites, uh, a hatchery, a production facility, and our administration. The west, uh, in the west of the Faroes, there are there's a very high exposure of waves, and a lot of our sites have really strong currents. So we farm at the world's most exposed farming sites. This is the production of salmon in the Faroes. We've had our uh, ups and downs. Most recent was the ILA crisis in early 2000s. But after that, uh, there has been a steady growth. But the last years, the growth has stagnated. But it's not a similar trend at Hidden Fjord, where we have a, a quite a steady growth the last years. The stagnation in the Faroes is mostly because of uh, an increase in mortality, which has increased the last years. And the main driver for this mortality is the sea lice and, uh, and all the handling of the salmon. Again, we don't see the, a similar trend at Hidden Fjord. It's been going down the last years. And uh, even less mortality when we only look at large salmon. And this is mostly due to our uh, sea lice strategy, where we farm on exposed sites, which is easier to manage regarding sea lice, and we have a preventative approach to sea lice. We s try to have a short time on sea for the salmon. We use lumpfish, strategic deployment where we place fewer salmon in our problematic sites. Uh, a lot of planning and research where we know the hydrodynamics and the population dynamics of sea lice of all our sites and even, even pen specific. And we lobby for appropriately strict regulations. And if necessary, we will use a chemical treatment. So to manage this strategy, we have a strong biological development team. And this strategy starts with uh, large molts. So we started construction around year 2010. And the smolt weight has increased ever since. And is now uh, around 650 grams on average. 
This is our small facility at the year 2000, and this is how it looks today. And the red circle illustrates the old facility. So there's been a lot of construction. But when we finished in 2019, we could focus more on quality and uh, development. So we can have a better water parameters, a more stable environment, and, uh, and focus on, on development and data collection surveillance. An example of our development, this is a new way of transferring smolts to our sites. They are transferred by tank and put into a pipeline on our farming site. And seawater is pumped into the pipeline to keep a steady speed. And uh, here we measure oxygen and uh, insert oxygen to the water. And again here. So this pipeline is around 1,000 meters long, but we have transferred smalt as long as 1,300 meters. It's a very stress-free uh, transport. The smalt go st swim straight down and are very fast uh, on feeding. So this has helped with the growth on sea. Hedrifjord has had uh, historically a very uh, good growth on sea, but the last year it has uh, really exploded. And a lot of our pens uh, are above, well above 4 in TGC or VF3. Maybe even more, this is because of our huge effort in the feeding strategy and regime. We have a pellet detector and an automated feeding system from Faro C, which is really effective. And the large molds and uh, the high growth uh, has made it possible that uh, to uh, lower the time on sea a lot, around eight months over the last years, and we're now below 11 months on average for each pen. This means that our farming cycles are a lot faster. Uh, so over a period of, of time, we have uh, more farming cycles and more fallowing period than before. So this reduces the biological risk a lot. And it's a sustainable way of farming. If we look at the average number of salmon um, on sea at Hiddenfjord, we see that it decreases the last years, whereas the production increases a lot. So producing large moles, but uh, having fewer or e equal number of, of smalls on sea will increase your production, fewer sea lice, less handling of the salmon, and a lower biological risk. The only downside is that the higher intensity of our sites will uh, increase the pressure on the sediment. But again, here the solution is exposed farming, where it's resuspended and uh, easier to manage regarding sea lice. So here we have a, a particle uh, simulation with the current around Faroe Islands, made by Trondor Kragsten. So this is sea lice, and they are a common enemy because they can travel all the way around the ferals in, the, in their infective stage. We see the days counting uh, down there. Therefore, sea lice need a very strict regulation to avoid the tragedy of the commons. Yeah, you get the idea. So for sea lice modeling, we've used this a lot uh, the last year. This is an open source model made by Kragestin, where you can, it's an agent-based salmon lice model, tracking the development of alt stages, depending on temperature, and following the theory of internally infected sites and externally infected sites. So this is uh, an example of how we use it. This is our most problematic sea lice site. The dots are, the, are our sea lice counts, and the lines are, are the predicted counts by the model. And the columns are our treatments. And we see that it follows very well the model, but also we can model what happens if we don't treat or if we use another treatment or at a different time. And with this model, we can uh, choose the best uh, strategy so that we have as few treatments as possible over a cycle. This is a crucial tool, I think, for uh, internally infected sites. As I mentioned, we use lumpfish, 
so they are very effi efficient sea lice grazers, especially in the winter time. And the mortality uh, at Hidden Fjord has been steadily decreasing the last years. And we've made a lot of research uh, into new vaccines. We've developed a couple and uh, a lot of strategy and uh, on how and when and where to put them and uh, a lot of research into feeding and heights. So uh, we are res uh, we are um, we have reason to think that uh, the it will be the well-being will be at a satisfactory level. So another example of our Sheila strategy. Again, this is our most problematic site. The last four cycles, we see that uh, the number of sea lice produced has gone a lot down the last four cycles, as well as the mortality of, of uh, big salmon. And even the total number of treatments at the site has decreased. And this is the newest addition to our strategy. We have bought three semi-closed containment systems which will uh, be used for our next farming cycle. So in 2010, uh, the salmon was around 10 months on land and 20 months on sea. With our construction of the hatchery, the salmon is now 20 months on sea and 10 months, uh, 20 months on land and 10 months on sea. And with the semi-closed cage, they will be in there for another five months and resulting in only five months at sea. So this will be a huge impact on on the sea lice. So lastly, our opinion on what the industry should focus on. Uh, large molds of good quality and keeping a fewer or equal number of smolts to keep it sustainable. Uh, fast growth. Uh, we have to research more in lump fish to get the mortality down and genetics, strategic deployment, so we can utilize the good sea lice sites better. And sea lice modeling, as mentioned, and uh, strict sea lice regulations. In the short run, maybe some sites it will be problematic, but in the long run, it will be beneficial for all. And then we are very excited about our semi-closed containment systems, and we are quite certain uh, this will be the future of, of salmon farming in the Faroes. Thank you. Thank you. Our final, final presentation today is what we call a special presentation. It's entitled Sea Lice in Aquaculture, an overview of current global trends. We look forward to, hear, uh, to hearing Professor E. Bricknells talk about the current state of sea lice and the professor's assessment of what the future might have in store for us all. Please. The floor is yours, Ian Bracknell. Well, thank you very much uh, for that wonderful introduction. And, and uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the organizers to invite me to uh, uh, give this talk. It, it's a great honor for me to be here. And I'm going to talk about sea lice in aquaculture. And I've taken a little bit of liberty with sea lice. And I want to expand that into potentially emerging copepods of aquaculture interest. So I've taken some liberty with that, but I really want to look uh, the data I'm presenting here is, is particularly uh, research papers that have mentioned parasitic copepods and aquaculture as key words. Now, we all have, have heard about sea lice. We know that they can cause around a billion dollars in losses to salmon farms every year. There are some estimates that say that it costs around 0.9 of a US dollar per kilogram of, of uh, salmon produced is spent on lice control. And it's considered to be the number one economic cost to aquaculture worldwide, mainly because of the high value of Atlantic salmon. And as we know, uh, parasites can affect uh, host fitness and survival. Most people uh, or most organisms have a few parasites and it causes a slight inconvenience, a slight loss of fitness, if you like, where you lose a little bit of condition, but we all live with parasites. But then as they increase, well, they may start causing welfare issues to that as animals. That may go into clinical disease and ultimately lead to the animal's death. And those outcomes occur in both wild and farmed fish. 
And we shouldn't forget that. We can get natural epizootics, as you can see in the photograph on, on the left, uh, of uh, an, outspot, an outbreak of, of uh, parasites uh, in a lake, which caused a massive fish kill. But they're a natural situation and that we have to live with them when we're farming fish in open aquaculture. And they have a massive economic uh, impact. They cost uh, around $9.6 billion a year, and sea lions represent around 11.5% of that. The next three are white spot, gyrodactylus, and saprolegnia. But there are other parasitic copepods that contribute to those losses. But we don't hear much about them. And, and, and the question is why? Well, there's the economic impact. Many freshwater species have a low economic value. And therefore, they don't make that top 10 uh, of, of economic uh, thresholds that get uh, fish farmers and, and the economy to take notice of them. There's awareness. A lot of these copepods occur in developing countries, and they may not have robust fish house monitoring systems. This agallid uh, in the paper to our right um, uh, affects uh, a cichlid from uh, South America, but it comes predominantly from uh, Ecuador and that area. And again, we, we don't hear very much about Ecuadorian aquaculture outside that country. Some have relatively easy treatments. Freshwater uh, ponds can be drained and dried, and they don't seem to have developed anywhere near the same drug resistance we, we see in uh, Lepioptera salmonis and uh, Caligus roger cressii. And I did a search for research papers that specifically mentioned parasites, copepod parasites, and aquaculture, but I excluded uh, Caligus, uh, Elongatus, Roger Cressii, and Lepioptera salmonis. And there were 190 papers published over the last 40 years or so, compared to almost 1,500 papers that mentioned sea lice in that same time window. So there may be a research funding issue too. But what are those parasites in fish aquaculture? Well, not surprisingly, the review carried out in marine aquaculture by Johnson et al., identified Caligus and Lepiopterus and Ergalicids and other families uh, occurring in the marine environment. And that hasn't changed very much. Of those 190 papers I looked at, 15 were Caligus, seven were Lepiopterus. There were six unidentified Caligids and three, three uh, Ergocilids. And in freshwater, the picture was similar, but with the Ergocilids and the Lernia and the Cyclopodia uh, topping uh, those uh, research papers, with 12 unidentified parasites that cause an aquaculture issue. But we'll look at the elephant in the room first, which is Lepioptera salmonis and its supporting act. So we're going to look at Europe first. Well, the major sea lice here is, of course, Lepioptera salmonis, or as I should say now, Lepioptera salmonis salmonis, the Atlantic subspecies. And Caligus elongatus is a supporting act which causes minor issues. And the treatment thresholds for this um, parasite, uh, where it emerged first as an economic impact, was set around 20 years ago. Ireland in 2000 set limits between 0.3 and 0.5 egg-bearing females in the spring and two for the rest of the year. Norway set it at one to five adult females per fish back in 2000. And Scotland initially established a voluntary code with overgenerous female per 10 fish in the spring. Well, that's been revised quite a lot since there, and we've seen from the other talks at this conference that sea lice remain an important issue for control in Europe. It hasn't gone away yet, even though we have all these controls. Now, in my neck of the woods, uh, as you know, I got deported from Britain a few years ago, and I've been over here now for nearly 15 years. Our major uh, problem um, in, in our fish farms in, in eastern North America is Lepioptera salmonis salmonis, and again, we have Caligus elongatus. Now, when I moved over here in 2007, I was told by a colleague, what are you going to research on, Ian? Because we don't have a problem with sea lice. And within two years of myself arriving in, in, in the mid noughties we saw this increase, rapid increase in sea lice on our fish farms, so much so it caused a lot of problems. And this asks the question, why? Were we seeing issues with climate change, a change in farming practice, changes to the hydrography, or drug resistance emergence? And the answer is complicated, but it's certainly all of these. And if you look at the uh, photo, the diagram on, on the, the right of this screen, 
you can see the mean sea surface temperatures from 82 to 2000 on the left and from two on 2010 to 2020. And you can see we've had a major change in the Gulf Stream and warmer surface waters. And certainly we proposed that in our paper earlier this year, that one of the reasons why we see more uh, sea ice issues in, in North America, at least eastern, uh, western, eastern North America, is this warming uh, of, the, of the Gulf Stream affecting the Gulf of Maine and making our habitat, especially our winters, a little warmer and causing problems with sea ice. We have a similar problem in, in, in uh, Pacific North America, but here the major sea louse is Lepiopteris salmonis on Carinchiae, the Pacific subspecies, with Caligus curtis as support. And this appears to be a subspecies that emerged due to allopatric speciation, and it has a change in its biology. It uses sticklebacks as a host far more than those of Salmonis salmonis, and it's caused the closure of marine salmon farming in Washington state. And as we know, there's a huge controversy with pink salmon in the Broughton Archipelago, where we have this complex interaction between sticklebacks and salmon smolts. And indeed, we've even observed the sticklebacks cleaning pink salmon smolts under certain conditions. So we don't know the full biology there, but certainly on the West Coast, this has put a huge pressure on aquaculture. In Japan, we don't, well, we seem to be lucky in Japan. They don't seem to be a big issue. The farms are predominantly coho salmon based on rainbow trout based. And we, again, we see uh, Lepiopthara salmonis on Carinchiae is reported in Farm Fish by uh, Nagasara in uh, 1993. And Nagasara also saw them earlier uh, on Onkarinka's Kita in 1985. And there are plenty of papers out there that report lice numbers increasing during a production cycle, but no. Uh, clinical um, interventions uh, seem to have been recorded. This is probably due to the innate resistance of Onkarinki forms to heavy infest infestations with sea lice. Russia is that a big enigma. Uh, there's three regions. We have them up in Archangel, and then in the Pacific, the Kamkatcha region and the Promiski region in Vladivostok. They produce about 20,000 tons a year. They farm predominantly sp Pacific species of salmon, but I couldn't find a single report of sea lice from Russia uh, in the literature. Now, I must admit, my Russian isn't good enough to translate uh, many papers, so I may have missed some. Now, Chile, as we know, has a large uh, issue uh, with Caligus roger cressii, and this is the louse that is causing the most interest in Chile. And we, we originally saw... Uh, sea lice on wild-run salmonids that were introduced for sport around 1880. And these are identified as Caligus terreres, uh, terres. And commercial salmon farming started in Chile around 1993. And again, we saw Caligus terres, the initial uh, colonizer of those fish. But around 2000, Caligus roger cressii seems to have jumped species from the uh, Robolo, uh, Eleganina, uh, Elegynus and um, Macluvinus, and this fish is associated with salmon farms. And it seems that there was a species jump between the uh, two hosts. And this has caused a complex ecology between wild farm fish and uh, uh, Caligus roger cressii. Indeed, some people have proposed Caligus roger cressii have species jumped many times. And we have some evidence that. Caligus roger cressii from farm salmonids prefers to settle on farm salmonids than their original host. So we seem to be seeing a rapid evolution of Caligus roger cressii in Chile. And of course, we've also had the problems with uh, drug resistance, and it's been indicated as a potential transmitter of Piscirrhachia salmonis. So Caligus roger cressii remains a major parasite of interest in the region. And of course, who can forget Australia? We've only had one report of a copepod parasitized on farm salmonids. This came from Tasmania, and Calidus longirostris was reported by Barbara Nowak back in 2011. Again, suggesting to me at least, copepods are very good at evolving so they can rapidly adapt to new niches, such as new species migrating into an area. But of course, we have to consider it is Australia, and we know everything in Australia needs to kill something because all their wildlife is so dangerous. Now, there are plenty 
of other copepods of concern. I went to the F, uh, the FAO and I looked at the top farm species of fish, and we can see that they're well split between marine, brackish, and freshwater, and all have reported caligid species associated with them. So going back to those 190 papers, 87 were for freshwater copepods and 103 for marine copepods. And the freshwater copepods were predominantly agacillids, lernids, and salmonicola. And the rest of the unusual uh, freshwater uh, species um, were predominantly had less than three research papers. So I didn't record them individually because it would be quite a long list. But we see emerging marine copepods too. 82% of those papers reported emerging parasites or parasitic copepods on farmed fish that hadn't been reported before. And again, they're mostly the Caligus and Lepidoptera species. Remember, these are almost exclusively parasitic uh, clades within the siphonostoma. And the other species were represented by less than three papers each. But one that was a particularly interesting note was we saw a, a species of sarcotases causing an issue in an aquaculture situation on rock bass in South Korea. And this is a very interesting internal parasite that seems to have a life cycle like a marine botfly, causing these large cysts within the flesh uh, in which is, is a, um, a, a parasitic copepod that is, is very degrading to both the fish's health and the market value of those animals. So to start to wrap up, the ancient wisdom of, of Biang Kui said advice, the skillful treat doctor treats those who are well, but inferior doctor treats those that are ill. And we must remember, as parasitologists and sea life specialists, prevention is better than cure. We should be keeping an eye on these emerging trends within sea lice, in aquaculture, in both fresh and marine and the emerging species. Because if we don't, we're going to be super busy firefighting these emerging species, just like we ended up doing with Lepidoptera salmonis, Caligus roger cressii, uh, back in the 70s and 80s, which I'm old enough to remember at the start of my career. So that's why I want to wrap it up. I want to say thank you again, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all in the beautiful Pharaohs next year. And of course, I have to thank uh, all the people that have helped me uh, in my uh, career and my lab. Of course, Jim Treasurer, James Braun, Jessica P, Sarah Barker, Debbie Bouchard, Stuart Johnson, Mark Fast, Mike Petrak, my lab, just to name but a few. But the people I've collaborated with uh, since I've been in North America, Cook Aquaculture, um, the um, USDA uh, National Cold Water Marine Aquaculture Centre, the Aquaculture Research Institute here, the School of Marine Sciences and funded bodies like the National Science Foundation, NRAC, MAIC, uh, and of course, Benchmark Animal Health. And of course, last but not least, I have to make a, a final plug for Lepioptera Salmonis, who's paid my mortgage for very for, for many, many years. And thank you uh, for the evolution of that animal. So thank you all for listening to me. I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, next year. And with that, I will sign off. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Brucknell, for a most interesting overview of uh, the sea lice and aquaculture. And thank you for, pre uh, for presenting your views in the current trends in industry. I would love to discuss this further, but I guess we'll have to wait until the big conference yeah. in Torsham next year. Yes, and on that note, today's agenda concludes. But tomorrow is another day, same time and same place. We will be back talking about expanding options for integrated pest management, improved tools for a sustainable future, um, there are some very interesting um, presentations on there, uh, sea lice based, yeah. And we're looking forward to having you all with us again online tomorrow. Uh, feel free to share the conference link in your professional networks. And uh, please uh, let us hear your thoughts about the day today in the poll that you can see on your right side uh, on your screen. So with that, we end the day and we'll see you tomorrow.